let's get started with the match between Dortmund um, and you know their nil nil draw at the weekend against Heidenheim. Um, guys, I think it's probably fair to say we're expecting some sort of um, an upset, if you will. I actually predicted this to be a draw. I think I went two two, hopefully uh, or optimistically. Um, Fortunately, I missed this game. It felt like 90 minutes I won't be getting back. Uh, Matt, Seb, you guys both watched it. Um, I'll come to you first, Matt, actually. There's two ways to maybe look at this game. There's A, this result's been a long time coming. Uh, you know, we've talked a lot about how Dortmund have been winning games, but far from, um, you know, conclusive in their performances. Or what a lot of people might do when they wake up on Monday morning, look at the results and see how many players were injured for this match. And just to kind of give a brief rundown, uh, it's more or less a start in 11. We're talking Adeyemi, Julian Brand, Duranville, Sebastian Haller, Gregor Kobel, Nemcha, Marco Royce, Julian Rearson, and Jaden Sancho all out of this match. Where do we, where do you fall on that kind of scale of giving them uh <laughs> credit for getting a point to begin with or was it a sorely two points dropped um you're right it was coming um i was at the first two games against darmstadt and uh and cologne and then despite the results actually very similar performances to what we saw in in heidenheim um bochum similar difference being that in heidenheim uh, Dortmund didn't produce those individual moments which have got them out of jail so uh, so so often, whether that be Jimmy Bino Gittens producing moments of pace to break defences down the right, whether it's Nicholas uh, Nicholas Fulkrog stepping up with penalties, like yeah, for hat tricks largely from the penalty spot with with all due respect. Um yeah, there were a lot of players missing. Um you've just been through them. On the other hand, a lot of those absentees weren't missing in the previous performances when it wasn't actually that much different um so yeah this this was very much a, a continuation on on the other hand if you look at the bigger picture maybe 10 points from the first four games um 10 goals to one maybe you know maybe, maybe you can look at a glass glass half full in, in in that sense but the performance really wasn't good and we, we said this for the previous games as well they were not good performances and this time they can't even cover it up with a with a win. And um, I think Edin Terzic knows it. Um, he looked he looked as angry as I've I think ever seen him um, in some in, in his in his post match interviews and uh, uh, and his press conference in which he in which he repeated the point that he's been dealing with unsatisfied players for the past weeks and months who have been demanding to play and yeah by all accounts complaining that they're not getting minutes and um, well they got their they got their minutes in Heidenheim as it said and uh, it was far too little mm. it it feels like there's a frustration at Dortmund Seb it's certainly something I've noticed um, you know I, I actually do frequent the Reddit forum for the Dortmund page and they do like a match thread and that's where the fans obviously jump in after games and for the last more or less since the turn of the year really um there's been frustration and it felt like this result was finally a kind of um what's the word I'm looking for? Lightning rod for a lot of the kind of frustration that's been building up over the last month or so. And a lot of Dortmund fans saying, you know, this is proof of the theory or the concerns that we've had that this team aren't really going anywhere. They're kind of almost like treading water and um, you know, this is just proof of it. I mean, is that a bit harsh or or, or do you think um the, 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 that kind of criticism is warranted. No, I don't think it's harsh. And I think also it feels like this game was always going to produce this response because I I, I just think Frank Schmidt is a better coach than Intezic, like fundamentally. And Matt touched on it before about Dorman's reliance on individual moments. I don't think that's ever going to be enough away to Heidenheim. Um especially given the kind of the individual players that Terzic was able to put out. I also think if you're a Dortmund fan, like, first of all, you, you might concede that it could have been worse. Kleindienst had two, the two best chances of the game. Definitely should have scored the first one after that sloppy pass from Sally Özcan. Um, had he not kind of inexplicably fallen over uh, in injury time at the end of the second half, he would have scored the winner. But 
like when you see that sloppiness, it always seems to be indicative of something which is not quite right in a team. Um, I don't think that's fair. It's like a, it's a kind of a point that you, media people like me make, um, people who've never been inside a dressing room or a you know professional football pitch. Um, but I think it's a lot of it's fair because I, I think also like if you were if you're a Dortmund fan and, and you were held at Heidenheim, I think you'd say, okay, well they haven't lost there since October. Um, and they've beaten better sides than Dortmund this season. At the same time, what was there in that performance that you could cling to and say, hey, well, you, know, you didn't get the result, but there's something promising in there. What, where, where was the... There was nothing in it that told us anything that we didn't already know. Like, I didn't think Makoku and Fulkrug worked as that sort of, like, semi-two at the top of the pitch. Didn't work at all, really. Um, I'm not a Donny Marlon fan. I don't think he's a particularly good player. He's a, he's a 7 out of 10 player. Didn't think he influenced the game. Özcan, Özcan to me, still looks damaged from uh, that performance against Bayern um, back in the autumn when he just looked... He just got obliterated in midfield. Um, and they they look they look fragile at the back and part of that is Kobel being missing. But there's not there's not much cause for optimism. So I don't really have a problem with 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 the Dortmund fans' response. And also, like given the kind of fluctuations at the top of the club, um Akivat's got obviously on his way out and the kind of the uncertainty that that breeds, dissatisfaction with the transfer activity, like there's not a lot at Dortmund at the moment which isn't fluid on a week to week basis, is there? So what are you what are you buying into? That's really a question rather than an accusation. I, I I'm not a Dortmund fan, so I, I'm not I have no vested interest. But what is it that you're supposed to believe in at Dortmund at the moment? Like apart from maybe the promise of someone like Jamie Bino Gittins, perhaps, or you know, like a micro issue like that. I, I don't know what I, I don't know where the optimism is supposed to come from. Yeah. That's such a really interesting point because it is that kind of malaise, isn't it, from one week to the next and the lack of any kind of you can understand if there's a young head coach who's trying to build towards something, but it, it just continually feels like Terzic is just kind of, he's got his magic eight ball or cue ball, whatever it's called, and he's just picking his lineups based on that almost. There's no kind of coherent strategy behind it. I continue to come back to this almost over-reliance on Julian Brandt. Um, and like I said, I didn't watch the game, but I did check some stats before um, we came on to do the show. And, you know, if you look at all the players who've created key passes in the Bundesliga this season, which is a pass that leads to Shaw, He's the only Dortmund player in the top 50, whereas, you know, Leverkusen have three in the top 10, Bayern Munich have countless, RB Leipzig have... Stuttgart. Well, yep, Stuttgart, Leipzig have four, I think, in the top 20. The next player for Dortmund is Nicholas Fulkrug at 48, um, you know, which probably says everything you maybe need to know. Um, you can then kind of look at passes into the final box and... Again, it's there's only three players in the top Dortmund uh, for the Dortmund team there, and it if it, it feels and if it, it feels like even that system where he's almost playing like a four three three or in this case a four four two, it feels like such a kind of very basic and simplistic tactic or formation. And you know we're going to put out four defenders or we'll put out three strikers, and let's just hope something magical happens in between that to make it all gel together. Did you did you think Stefan that like? So when I watched this game, I, I, I saw a little bit of intent from Terzic because I, I would say that like maybe this is probably closer to a kind of um, like a, a Leipzig style 4 2 2 2. And that was probably a recognition of the fact that if you play with like a single centre forward and two wide forwards, you're kind of playing into Heidenheim's hands because they're so good at, you know, against the cross and they're so good at blocking up the centre of the pitch that you're trying to compensate for Brandt's absence by loading the middle of the pitch. But you can't do that if you haven't got number tens in your side. Like there's no one, there's no one there who can pass the ball. So it's like this kind of, it doubles down on whatever frustration you feel with Terzic. It's kind of well, he also doesn't really have the tools when okay, the injury list is long, but even when everyone's fit, there are still there, there is still that reliance on Brandt because he's really the only player who does what he does in this squad. I think a reliance, a reliance on Brandt, but also on substitutions, which we've touched on it before in recent weeks that. One thing that Edin Terzic does often get uh, get right, and that's to his credit, is that he I think he does change the game uh, frequently with with the substitutions and with impact players off the bench. Makoku, Bano Gittens, often they don't necessarily have the same effect when they're starters. But in 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 Heidenheim, um, his substitutions I thought for for ones that had the opposite effect. Even they didn't work. I don't think particularly particularly bringing off Bano Gittens I thought was a, a strange one. Um, I mean, he, he wasn't. 
he was hardly um, pulling up trees, but um, he, he probably was Dortmund's most dangerous player. And to bring him off in the second half, I thought was a strange one. Uh, Bado Gittens himself, he looked frustrated com- coming off, and I think understandably. Um, Ben Zabaini being brought on was almost single handedly culpable for that for conceding a goal in the in, in the ninety second, ninety third minute. That that cross that came across to the back post where um Ben Zabaini has left uh, I think it's Shimmer completely unmarked at the back post. Um so it could have backfired pretty spectacularly. Um otherwise, yeah, I think the the point regarding Dortmund being forced to go down the middle, yeah. Clearly worked from a Heidenheim perspective. Um, Dortmund were incredibly narrow. They, I mean, Fulkrug, Marlin, Mukoku constantly chipping chipping over each other's feet um, in that really in those really central areas. I thought there was also a strange irony to Dortmund's best move of the match, which led to Marlin's disallowed goal. Um, and it was a good move. It's probably the only time they moved it quickly and clinically and cleanly through midfield. Um, but even that came as a result of. Thomas Mounier almost giving the ball away at right back and prompting what what Heidenheim would probably claim was a foul on um on Kleindienst. I'm not sure. Maybe he gets just he gets just ahead. But the, the only reason that tackle takes place is because his touch is terrible and he's almost given the ball away in a dangerous position. And it's only arguably because of that that Dortmund are able to break so cleanly and with so much space. So yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, with, without a doubt, Dortmund's worst 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 performance of the season. And as for where they go. Um, you've touched on the bigger picture. I do suspect that it's a bit of a the season is already a little bit of a write off given given the changes which are taking place um in the bigger in, in the in the bigger structures of the club. Um it's difficult to see where it goes. Um who, who replaces Fatsko, what role that leaves Sebastian Kale playing, does he does he move into a, um a, a role with a similar seniority to Vatsko, what happens with Matthias Sammer as Fatsko's pers- uh, personal advisor. Um, there's so many ups and downs, and whatever structure comes in, are they going to stick with Edin Terzic? Is, is he because is he going to suit whatever strategy ends up being in place? The whole thing seems a little bit up in the air, which leads to the rest of this season being a little bit of a riot off, I suspect. Mm, yeah, I mean that's probably a good way to maybe put a cap on this because I wanted to kind of say Seb that you look at those next kind of run of fixtures that Dortmund have in the coming weeks. They got Freiburg at home, Wolfsburg away, and then they got PSV in the Champions League. Then even after that. Hoffenheim, Union and Bremen they're all more or less I mean perhaps maybe PSV in the Champions League there's six fixtures there that you could see Dortmund continuing to kind of sleepwalk through before you know they play the big hitters in March you know Frankfurt, Bayern, Stuttgart Leverkusen, Leipzig really in the space of you know six or seven weeks and and it's and it's and it and it does maybe perhaps just suggest that this kind of concern over the malaise or not a lot happening might continue on for a little longer yeah i also i worry about dortmund in that psv game just because that is a dangerous dangerous team to be playing at the moment unbeaten in domestic football all season uh cantering really to the eredivisie title and from an attacking standpoint like just pretty potent um and some of the, the football some of the defensive football we've seen from dortmund recently I know that their Champions League form has been above what they've done in the Bundesliga, but at the same time, like they look vulnerable. Um, and yeah, like I, I, I don't feel confident predicting what Wolfsburg are going to be like week to week at the moment. I don't think, I don't think even Nikita Kovac knows. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's, it's troubling. Um, Stefan, if I may, just just one word on on Heidenheim. Um, one of my players of the season actually has, has been Jan Niklas Beste, who. I love watching. I really enjoyed watching in the Swider Bundesliga last season too. He's just a wonderful footballer. Um, and I know I'm a, almost certainly going to stay up the season, which is great credit to to Frank Schmidt. But um, yeah, he's got the irony of, of course, being as a former Dortmund player. I think he was spent some time in the Dortmund Academy. But just um, for anyone who hasn't seen him play, like he's uh, he's just a delight. And I, I thought he was like uh, probably the best player on the pitch again on Friday night. He, um, he gave Thomas Munier the run around all evening. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I really mean, like, he's done that to better players than Munier as well, like this season. And and uh, I just I, I'm impressed every time I watch him. Um, I knew very little about his backstory until last year, and and um, I, I I'm a sucker for that story of player gets discarded when he's quite young and then works his way back up the the divisions. And now he looks like he's worth you know twenty twenty five million euros. He's a super player. Mm, absolutely no, it's, a, it's a nice positive uh, note to end that game on actually. I felt like I needed to redress the balance you know it's Monday <laughs> we, we can't be that negative this early in the week 